It's Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at DEF CON. Be, be amazed I'm alive. <laughs> I didn't say not hungover, I said alive. <laughs> so, hey everyone, I'm Dan. Um, if you're expecting some, you know, second Dan Kaminsky talk, that's not at all what this is about. A um, couple months ago, Tiffany and Engrain came to me asking for, uh, for some data. For, for some reason, they thought I had DNS information. Um, and I asked them, you know, what for? And they, they actually explained it to me. And I'm not going to you know, steal Engrain's thunder, but um, it was one of those really classic hacking is not about you know, some crazy stunt you pull. Sometimes it's just about noticing something so painfully obvious you're amazed it's never come up in discussion before. Um, I was really impressed. I thought it was something that really should be at DEF CON. And um, I think we really do need to have, a, have more speakers, more mentorship in our community. So I said, dude, come out to DEF CON, present your data, we'll all like it. And we'll all come and listen to you talk. So. That's what we're here for, and uh, I will give the mic over to Engrain. All right, how's everyone doing? Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. This, this is my first time at DEF CON and presenting, so thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, All right, Engrain, <laughs> drink. Uh, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. Okay. That's, I'm all set. Um, I am N. Green, but my real name is Elliot Bradbury. Um, yes, here we go. Well, first of all, I just want to say that uh, while the information in my section of the presentation is uh, specific to USM, we actually found that it applies to other universities, a lot of other universities. So I don't want to make the impression that we're targeting uh, the University of Southern Maine, because um, that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, okay, so <clears throat> discovery. Well, I first connected to the USM network in uh, spring of 2008, and it was uh, on the wireless network on our campus. And I just want to start by saying our campus is, is split between two cities, so it's kind of uh, weird. One of the cities has all the dorms, and then there are some classrooms there. Uh, and then the other campus has all classrooms. So. Uh, when I say wireless network, I'm usually talking about the campus uh, that's all classrooms, that's in Portland. Uh, so I first connected to that network uh, in the spring of 2008, and <clears throat> naturally, one of the first things I did was connect to IRC, you know, just as usual. And uh, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so I was just hanging out, joining the normal servers that I do, and all of a sudden I realized that people <laughs> were addressing me with my full name, and I thought, okay, either I got hacked or someone's just playing a joke on me. Um, and I just dug around a little bit. It really only took a simple who is on myself and discovered that, uh, first of all, the DHCP server that's used on the wireless network leases internet routable IP addresses, completely public IP addresses. Um, and that, more importantly, the domain names take the form of First name dash last name dot wireless dot usm dot main dot edu, and I was just yeah awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, later in the fall of 2008, discovered that the dorms I moved on campus. No, so now to the other city of uh, Gorham, and uh, discovered that the dorms have a similar configuration. And uh, in the dorms, you generally use the wired. Ethernet land there, so um, those uh, that network has a similar configuration. Your your domain name is first name dash last name dot dorm dot usm dot main dot edu, um, and actually uh, the, earlier this summer, <laughs> I I had to go into IT the IT office on campus uh, to get some help with a separate issue, and uh, I don't know if anyone uses Horde the webmail client, but it it logs where you last. Uh, logged in from the IP address or the, or the domain name and so when I went into the office the uh, the person that helped me let me log into my email account from there so it kind of exposed that they're using even a similar configuration for their own IT staff so uh, 
they, the domain names take the form of first initial, middle initial, last name, dot ACS, dot USM, dot main, dot EDU. So even from within the IT network, they have a similar configuration. So uh, what does this mean exactly with these uh, unnecessarily verbose uh, domain names? It means that sensitive information is now unnecessarily public um, and it's out there for anyone. You know, it just takes a simple reverse DNS lookup and you have all this information. So what information exactly does the domain name that is assigned to you when you connect to these different networks, uh, what, does it, what does it contain? Well, uh, the most general thing and pretty much unavoidable is that the user is attending a main university. You really can't avoid that piece of information. Uh, more specifically that the user is attending University of Southern Maine uh, and how the user is connected to the network. And uh, if, if, well, there's basically two ways that you connect. There's the wireless network or there's the wired LAN in the dorms. And especially with prior knowledge of how the campus is set up, the split campus, um, it's, it's easy to get an approximate physical location from your domain name just from looking at it because there's the either wireless subdomain or dorm subdomain. Um, and lastly and most importantly, the user's full name is in there for everyone to see. Um, so the bottom line is that it's just an unacceptable uh, policy. Why on earth are they using these naming conventions when you access the network, when you, when you log in, why is, why is it like this? So uh, uh, at about the, the time that I realized that this was a really bad thing, I uh, wanted to, to really do more research, so I decided to turn it into a class project for Tiffany. Um, and this is when I started looking into how access is controlled on the network. Um, uh, the the wireless network is uh, not open to the public, so there are some forms of access control. Um, so I remember when I first connected, uh, I think I was using my laptop. You're required to uh, log in with your with your uh, university account, um, and this is probably very common. Probably you know any other college students could confirm that there. Uh, universities do a similar thing. So basically, the first time you, you connect a device, uh, you're redirected to a web page um, that asks you to enter your, your university <clears throat> account information. Um, and at USM, actually when you go to the page, it tells you this is your MAC address, and so enter your password. So it was pretty obvious that what, what they were doing for a, an access control system was uh, they were pairing your MAC address with your university account. Um, and so if you uh, successfully authenticate, then that MAC address is permanently paired with your account and uh, it's also paired with a semi-static public IP address. I say semi-static because it's reserved for you but they still use DHCP. And I want to stress public IP address, meaning that it's internet routable, you're not shielded by any edge devices, there aren't any routers in your way, everyone's just right out there, completely public IP addresses. Um, so after you go through this authentication process for the first time, uh, <clears throat> subsequent access to the network is just automatic. You don't have to log in every time you want to use the network. Um, and that's because you've already registered that device, you've already registered that MAC address. Um, so there's this network-wide device registration database and it somehow interfaces with the DHCP server so that it leases the correct IP address to you. Okay, so <clears throat> so weaknesses in this access control system. Well, complete trust is placed in the MAC address as a unique identifier, which isn't a bad thing, but it shouldn't be trusted that it can never be changed. Everyone knows that you can spoof MAC addresses. Um, okay, so that's the, probably the biggest uh, weakness here. 
The second one is why are they using global, global IP addresses? It just puts the user at a, an unnecessary risk and uh, I don't, maybe someone can tell me, but I don't know why they use a, a, a configuration like that. Uh, just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and then the third weakness is that there's no port-based security on the, on the LAN in the dorms, meaning that uh, MAC addresses are not locked to physical ports on the switch. And it's pretty much impossible to do that uh, on campus because you know pretty much everyone has a laptop. They register it in their room, run next door to their friend's room, plug it in there, go to another dorm, whatever. You just can't you can't lock down the network like that. It's just too mobile. So uh, potential for abuse here. What if what if you spoof your MAC address? to someone else's that's already registered on the network. You would effectively impersonate that user and be able to do whatever you want, um, basically under their identity. You could view questionable web content, you could do file sharing, whatever you want to do. Um, and how, how could that be done? Well, basically well, what it would involve was would be <clears throat> logging what users are on the network. And that's very simple. It's just you can basically sit there and passively sniff any kind of traffic and uh, log who, ha who has access to the network. Um, and basically what you're doing is recreating the uh, database that the university uses to see if a user is allowed on the network. So you're, you're, you're basically making your own copy so you know, okay, these, these MAC addresses are valid and um, because of the domain name that gets assigned to you when you access the network, you actually have a list of full names and the MAC addresses that, uh, that go with those accounts. So, so um, you can basically pick and choose if you wanted to. If someone wanted to do this, you could pick by name, okay, I want to uh, screw Tiffany over, so I'm going to take her, <laughs> take her uh, identi identity and, uh, I don't know, do some bad things, hack into some university servers or something. Th that's possible. Not that th you would want to do that. That's a terrible idea. Um, I'm just saying it's, it's possible, I guess. Uh, okay, so kind of some unanswered questions here. Um, the DHCP servers build these uh, domain names and dole them out to the users along with their IP address and all the other usual information that uh, DHCP does. Um, but how exactly is, is the DHCP server uh, giving you your, your subdomain? Like, how is it adding your full name in there? How does it know what your full name is? Um, so is, it, is this feature part of a DHCP package or is it something that the university has created themselves? Are they possibly uh, pulling that information from their, their HR database or something along those lines? Um, that's not clear, the back end, how they're getting your full name. I mean, obviously they have it, but is this uh, a feature that's built into a DHCP server already? Um, why is each device on the network given an internet relatable IP address? Um, and most importantly, why does my host name contain my full name? <laughs> okay, so um, I created this proof of concept tool. It's just a network analysis tool, very simple. Uh, you could actually kind of recreate it with uh, other tools to group together, but uh, it, it basically logs the MAC addresses and domain names, which contain full names, of anyone that accesses the network. Um, and then, f so once you build up this database, you can then, um, at a later date, scan the network, compare the two lists, see what hosts are online, which ones are offline, and that kind of gives you an idea of where you could go from there. Um, and I'm, I'm still working on it, um, work in progress, but I will make it available at that URL. Um, and that's pretty much my part. Tiffany? <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, my name is Tiffany Rad, and I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Southern Maine. I teach in the computer science department, and I teach a class um, where we analyze technical uh, aspects of computer programs, hacking networks, and then we look at the legal aspects of it. I'm also a licensed attorney in the state of Maine, and um, we found that uh, having an ethics class required for all computer science undergraduates is pretty important because when we do look at uh, network analysis tools, for instance. Um, there's one part, does it work? <laughs> yes, uh, Elliot's works fantastically. But then we look at other aspects of it, um, such as when we, when Elliot came to me with this, this was his final project for my class. Um, we were looking through the code, and I found out that it did something very interesting with reverse DNS. So who do I call? But Dan Kaminsky, and um, I was talking to Dan. And we we talked a little bit about um, what the tool did. And then we started thinking, well, the tool does this. What kind of legal, um, legal consequences or relation can we make to, uh, uh, to how USM is handling this, University of Southern Maine, and how uh, other schools are doing it? Um, I got to say about Elliot Bradbury that's fantastic is uh, he's one of the best students I've had in the computer science department. I come from Carnegie Mellon University where I got my BS and uh, yeah great thanks. <laughs> and uh, I'm very impressed with with Elliot in this class. He is the result of a high school program that goes on in Maine. I, I don't know if it still exists but it did when he was in high school called a Tiger Team. It's where they teach high school students how to hack and uh, they, they learn how to break stuff, they learn how to fix it, they learn the vulnerabilities and teaching uh, kids on that level uh, encouraged him to go into computer science in college and now he's a, he's going to I, I already know he's going to be a fantastic uh, security infosec researcher someday so um, I, I'm just saying he's a fantastic product of a high school program that he took through into into the college program all right so how these host name host name equals real names are used at many universities University of Southern Maine is only one of about 65 that we found and um, one of the things that we started talking about is, okay, real names equals host names. There's some privacy concerns. What are those? And what types of uh, federal law and privacy law affect those? And why, one of the questions we had is, why do universities, some of them do this, and so many do this? We were quite surprised when Dan was run, running some lookups how many we did find. So University of Southern Maine is in no way the only school doing this. There are quite a few. Um, the first thing we thought about was FERPA. FERPA is federal legislation that um, the, the government requires universities to protect students' uh, personally identifying information. And that means that um, uh, there's information that students, um, such as uh, in a directory, by default most schools have it that if you sign up for school, you go into, like for instance, a directory of who's at that school. Um, you can sign forms to opt out of that, but often that means your name won't get listed on Dean's List, for instance. Um, so FERPA is something that we looked at with this, and a lot of schools need to consider that because when um, people's real names are associated with the host names, um, if you think you're sending email anonymously, like uh, from an account that you've set up some, some other username, you're probably not. Um, it is something that uh, if you're doing Google searches, it is possible for people to find out who you, who you are um, if they look. So this information is coming outside of the university um, the way that it is set up. And we thought, okay, uh, what other issues can there be? With FERPA, uh, one of the, the things is if it's considered to be directory information that the school's releasing and the student hasn't signed an opt-out form, um, that's not a violation of FERPA. But with this, there is personal identifying information that is, it's possible for people to um, find out a lot more about students than just this is their name and they're on the internet. Um, some of the legal issues uh, we talked about is, is why, why, why do schools have this set up? And one of my specialties in addition to computer law is intellectual property. And um, there are certain types of legislation, I'm gonna talk briefly about the Digital Money and Copyright Act and just privacy law. Um, some of them use the, we believe the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is one of the reasons why um, some schools do release this information. When IT departments get takedown notices, for instance, very quickly they have a short window when they need to address who did this and send them a legal notice that this, this information must, um, must come down. Um, so I think that IT departments, we do set this up for, in, in, in relation to uh, how to deal with some of this uh, copyright law. Um, this is something that is, is one of the most interesting pieces that I found about this project when I read um, Elliot's final project, is that um, what can be done with this information? Uh, 
uh, if you're law school, if, if you have a university at which you, you study and there is a law school there, uh, so there's something called attorney-client confidentiality. And in, the, in a clinic setting in the law school, the lawyers work or professors who are uh, licensed practitioners take clients uh, into the program. And you do real cases. Uh, you go to court, you make filings. Privacy is really important. If you're one of these universities that have um, a 65 that we found, we're not releasing those names, but um, it's uh, not very difficult to do, uh, as Dan's gonna talk about some reverse DNS lookups to find who is doing this, but um, if you have uh, confidentiality that needs to be preserved, it's difficult uh, to do that. For instance, um, for a, a hypothetical would be in a law school clinic, if, uh, if for instance, if, if they're filing patents, it's very important when the patent system being first to file uh, that uh, you don't release any information about what the technology is if you're helping someone write the patent. If you're in a clinic setting and the, one of the attorneys working on the case has real name equals the host name, and this is kind of going out to the internet, someone could watch and potentially uh, find out what you're looking at and kind of piece together the technologies that make up the patent. All right, one of the other issues we talked about is did they do this to combat anti, well, combat piracy? Um, we were looking at some cases with the help I was working with. Um, Got a little bit of information from Ray Beckerman. He's done a lot of defense for students um, and has a great database about RIA cases. And um, the question we had is, is it possible for someone to determine who in like a, a person's full a person's full name, who is searching for music, downloading music or movies, where they're living, and is it possible that you could get around warrants required or court orders for, um, uh, for instance, the RAA or any organization like that to figure out who's doing what without having to go through the traditional warrant requirement and serve or get a court order and talk to the IT department at the university about that. Um, we, one of the things that we, what, what I will tell you is, uh, our, we did not find a way that we could technically prove that. So when I say that it, there might be a correlation, and is it possible that the RAA could determine what's coming out of universities, find out people's real names, who's downloading what, and then get the legal threat notices? Yes, it is possible. That's something that was one of the most interesting issues we had. Do we know they do it? No, we do not. Um, Dan and I were saying the only way that we could really figure that out is if one of us goes, you know, or for instance, it would probably be me, because I have an account on the universities, um, at the university, going down on like 9,000 9, songs, get on the RA's radar, and then determine, did they follow proper warrant procedures to find out my real name? And uh, neither of us wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, pretty risky, especially with uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the way that, um, they're pretty severe um, fines now people are getting for this. So there's, it's illegal, I wasn't gonna do that. So we cannot you're, find- You're not gonna get sued by the RIAA for DEF CON? I thought you were hardcore. Uh, <laughs> hey, Dan, you know, I, I think Elliot might be able to set up an account for you. Why don't, we, why don't you give it a try? <laughs> Yeah, I think he's okay. I am too. So we technically could not prove that um, the RAA, the cases that, I looked through probably a hundred cases in the RAA, ones that were universities got legal takedown notices, or legal threats for students, not necessarily takedown notices. And uh, all I can say is there, there are quite a few that have this set up. Um, and uh, the one thing that's kind of funny is if the RAA wasn't doing this before, well, here, here, we're telling you right now, it's, it's possible to do. And uh, whether you like the RA or not, um, uh, this is information that, that we wanted to talk about. And for instance, also, this applies to law enforcement. Um, if there are any, uh, it, it, there, it is possible to get information about what people are doing on the network. This is public information that's going out there. This isn't you're, private, this isn't, um, the question is, is there an expectation of privacy if your name is just going out saying, I am searching for medicinal uses of marijuana, it, 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 something like that. Um, if, there, if there is someone under investigation, this possibly is a way that you can get around getting a search warrant, is just look what's already being, out, being put out there. Um, there is a privacy concern, and Dan's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, when, like IRC chat rooms, your real name host, I mean, your host, it, it comes right up. It does reverse DNS look up, and there's your name. Um, Xbox Live, he was mentioning, does this too. So if you think you're at Nice University and your searches are private, they, they probably are not. And we found that this applies to both students and faculty members. Uh, I did a little bit of research. Some faculty members, their information is also being broadcast out. All right. Are there influences under the Digital Learning Copyright Act um, with the RIA? Like I said, we, we're not gonna, we can't prove that technically from what we've, we've looked into, but it would be disappointing to find that intellectual property law 
is affecting privacy in InfoSec. I, I got to say, I, I believe it probably is. And it's disappointing to see that some universities may have set up um, under pressure, uh, set up, um, I'd say, uh, an, where privacy isn't a, a, a concern because of, um, of copyright law and vigilant enforcement of that. And um, lastly, I was uh, about the DMCA, I mentioned already that there's a, there's a takedown notice requirement. Um, IT departments are under a, a ton of pressure. You gotta take this down, you gotta find out who this is, or you'll, you lose your safe harbor provision. And um, I'm working on a case right now where an ISP has lost a safe harbor provision, which means that they are going to be held uh, civilly liable for um, whatever it is that the, the, the defendant in the case is. So ISPs are under a great deal of stress under the takedown notice requirements. You don't wanna lose the safe harbor provision unless you're challenging the DMCA. And um, we talked about FERPA, and one of the things that Dan might, um, is probably gonna talk about is uh, recommendations for what should schools do. If you do care about, um, if you are concerned about this issue, maybe students should be opt-in. You know, if you want your name to be your host name, let them opt into that instead of opt out. And if schools are gonna have opt out, make the procedure, yeah, make the procedure very clear um, so that students and all students understand exactly technically what, well, technically explain the privacy implications of this. And um, we don't wanna say that there is a correlation, but um, it's, it is, um, we're, well, the REA could use this technology, especially since we're talking about it, and it's interesting after the school's been, our, well, the school that we looked at has been our University of Southern Maine doing this for about 10 years. And so if the RA hasn't been doing it already, well, maybe, maybe they can now. <laughs> and we're not supporting that, I'm just saying that, that is, it's possible with this information. And I'm um, sorry, that's the last slide, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Dan, um, Dan talk about uh, what he did with reverse DNS look up in his uh, results. Thank you. All right, so um, uh, just in case anyone in the room is not actually familiar with the, uh, the database being exposed, or the data set being exposed, uh, normal DNS traffic, you have a name, www.foo.com, you get an IP address, 1.2.3.4. In reverse DNS, you have the exact opposite. You provide an IP address, 1.2.3.4, and uh, you get back a name. Now, usually this name is like, the name of a computer and doesn't mean anything. In this case, no, that's the guy sitting behind the terminal, um, which is actually a fairly in, amusing uh, thing to populate inside of DNS. Um, in terms of being someone who's trying to uh, use or abuse this data, you pretty much have two different channels. Uh, the first channel is to just sweep the net, sweep, sweep IP ranges and see who's where. So you take a particular university that uses the system, you take their IP range, you just sweep through DNS, reverse DNS, and see what comes back. And what are you finding out? Well, there are this list of students, they're on this campus, maybe you know they're in you know, North Maine, you know, this area Maine or that area Maine. Eh, it's interesting, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not as interesting as the second mode. Second mode is where you host uh, some service on the internet. Uh, you host a web page, an ad network. Uh, you, uh, you host or you're in part of a peer-to-peer -peer network or you're playing Xbox Live. And in each of these situations, the IP address of a university student is provided to individuals outside of the university. That, at that time, the fact of what they are doing and who they are can actually be linked. So I bring up Xbox 360 because it's the source of what I thought was probably the funniest change to internet security in the last few years. Um, some guys figured out how to monetize botnets. And, uh, and the way they figured out how to monetize botnets was they rented, you had 12 year old kids renting botnets to each other so that that guy who was really pissing them off on Halo 3 well, they just go ahead and flood them off the internet for a few hours. Which I thought that was kind of amusing. And that, 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 gets, uh, that gets even more amusing when you realize not only that, but um, you kind of find out where the kid is and can you go look him up and send him a horse's head or something. <laughs> you shot me too many times. 
So, you know, this is, uh, DEF CON is traditionally considered a, uh, a security conference. And here we are talking about a lot of privacy implications. What's up with that? Well, this is really interesting. I mean, this has come up, uh, this has come up professionally in a fair number of audits that I've done. It turns out security work and privacy work, um, we kind of work together a lot. Uh, consider something like a phone home. You have a piece of software that is, is calling back to the mothership for something. On the one hand, well, this is a privacy implication. Did you ask the user, is it okay for you to go back? On the other hand, it's an awesome attack surface which is very often quite as vulnerable. So, you know, it is a very relatively common instance during an audit where phone homes are found. If you're doing it in a security context, you pop it over the fence to the privacy guys and say, hey, does this meet all the, the, uh, the legal requirements? And um, that's the other thing, that that's one thing that's really different. There are legal requirements in privacy. Um, in security, it's pretty much us geeks that think something needs to be done. Uh, you know, we're, we're all raw, raw, we want to see secure code, we want to see quality. No one really knows what that means. Well, no one knows what privacy means either, but that doesn't stop a heck of a lot of law and a heck of a lot of activism around, I don't want anyone to know. Uh, it turns out there's, in security, there's a thinking there might be a hacker and we should stop them if there were a hacker. In privacy, the assumption is always those bastard advertisers are selling my infos. <laughs> so um, it's a totally different uh, uh, presumption. It's a totally different burden of proof, and uh, it, it does actually uh, it does actually show up all over the place. Uh, there are uh, there's an interesting implication behind all of this. Nobody is saying that use of the internet at a university should be fully anonymous. In fact, the whole point of takedown provisions and other things is that you should actually, with some work, be able to get back to the individual that, uh, that was behind the traffic. We seem to be wanting to have a system which can be summarized as, in order to extract someone's identity from the network, it should be difficult, but not impossible. Building systems where it's difficult but not impossible for your uh, personal information to be exposed is starting to prove difficult, if not impossible, itself. Either you are fully anonymous and can't be tracked down at all, or there's a thousand different ways to get at your personal information. This particular path is a ridiculously easy way of getting at your information. Um, and that's kind of where, uh, where the concerns come in. There is an a really interesting implication of the spoofing work. Um, this is what I thought was really cool. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed this. People really believe whatever the hell it is the computer tells them. They do a lookup, it gives them an answer, says, aha, I have the answer, I'm gonna go move on with my life. Um, what, uh, what Endgrain found is that it's actually really easy to do uh, uh, look around, figure out what other people's MAC addresses are, and then later on spoof those MAC addresses so you can actually assume their identity on the network. Now, I think from his work when he was looking at this, he found this specifically in terms of just looking at what was on your LAN and just saying, okay, well, whoever has the IP 1.2.3.4 has the MAC address of this. If I use the MAC address of this, I will now have their name. That's how the system works. Turns out that actually also works off LAN as well. Uh, you issue a query with uh, NBT stat, and one of the helpful things you get out of Samba, out of SMB, is okay. Well, here's some here's the the user, here's the shares, and by the way, here's his MAC address, which it turns out on this network lets you go ahead and assume their identity to appear as them. It's bad enough having people think IP addresses are identities, but you know, what happens if any kid can just go ahead and appear to grab a bunch of porn or grab a bunch of problematic content or do a bunch of attacks and stick, you know, his, uh, his buddy or not so much his buddy's name all over it? That's going to be lawsuit bait. That's going to be really easy lawsuit bait. And at the end of the day, 
Not only is it lawsuit bait, it's lawsuit bait that wouldn't have been possible before. If you actually had a situation where it was difficult but not impossible to acquire the uh, authenticating information or the identifying information, there would be a human involved, there would be an investigation, and there would actually be enough resources applied to figure out the difference between, oh, this is just a trivial spoof, and wait a second, there's, a, there's something more interesting going on. The reality is a lot of people, when they're looking at computer systems, don't ask enough questions. This is DEF CON. We ask questions. So, you know, I think, I, I think I've uh, gone on uh, kind of long enough about uh, all the, uh, the interesting implications of security and privacy here. Um, as Tiffany said, like I said, you know, this is a small thing now. This could grow. This could be something that, uh, that we turn around and lots of places are doing it just to stop the flood of requests. If it's, you know what, we're getting a thousand takedown requests an hour. Why don't we just publish all the information and now people don't need to ask for it? That is a model. It could come. It would not actually be a good thing for the future of the internet. The reality is, and this is what all the privacy guys have figured out, perhaps long before the rest of us have, if you can't use the internet, if you can't use a resource without an implication that no one's watching over your shoulder, you just won't. And we won't end up with a particularly free society. So that's pretty much what I've got on this. I have one final thought to leave you with. Uh, how many of you guys are still in school? Cool. All of you, every last one of you, are going to have huge final projects to do. And you could do the normal thing, do something that's been done a thousand times before, get a pat on the back by a teacher who's done the same review over and over and over again. Or you could end up dragging your teacher out to DEF CON and showing off what you've done. 